those of you that uh, that don't uh, share that particular background, I think you'll find um, some parallels uh, to the Danish experience uh, as uh, as compared to the Norwegian experience. So we do like to, um, or we did maybe, like to consider ourselves a nation of immigrants. And people have been coming here to North America for more than 12,000 years. First, as indigenous peoples, uh, possibly arriving by sea or across the Bering Land Bridge. And later, about the year 1000, in Viking ships across the Atlantic Ocean. Then, in the 15th century, they came in large sailing ships from Europe and from Asia, and of course, unwillingly, from Africa uh, in the 17th century. And in the 1800s and 1900s, they came by steamships and by wagon or on foot. And today, many immigrants arrive in our country by airplane or car. Well, I'm guessing that uh, many of you are here either because you are an immigrant or because your ancestors uh, immigrated to the United States. An estimated one million immigrants came from Norway to the United States between the years 1830 and 1920, and no other country sent a greater percentage of its population here except for Ireland. So why did so many uh, large, or why did such a large number of people immigrate from Norway to the U.S. in the 19th and early 20th centuries? Well, to understand this, we have to understand a little bit about the geography of Norway and the topography. Um, as you probably know, Norway is located in northern Europe. It uh, shares borders with Sweden and Russia, and it's one of the very most mountainous countries in all of Europe. Um, it has an extremely long coastline, and about a third of the country is above the Arctic Circle. Only 3% of the land is flat, tillable, really good um, farmland. And I like this slide here because it really shows you the size of Norway as compared to our country. Um, it's, quite, uh, it, it, it's quite small compared to, uh, to the United States. Um, these are some photos of recent uh, uh, places that I guess that I visited recently in Norway. So I just want to show you uh, the beauty of, uh, of the land, lots of different um, uh, different things to see, and as I said, just very um, very beautiful. I think wherever you go. But what was Norway like uh, in the mid uh, 1800s when people were starting to think about coming to the United States? Well, it had a largely rural population, and so that meant that most people did not live in, uh, in major cities, and they had jobs that were somehow tied to agriculture. So they may not actually be doing the farming, but they might have a job like a blacksmith. Uh, they might be the baker. They might be teachers or pastors who served, uh, who served farmers and their families. There also was not a lot of mechanization in the early 1800s, uh, and that was uh, across the board in trades and other jobs, including farming. So a lot of processes were done by hand, um, but that would change later in the 19th century when industrialization moved into uh, Norway and, uh, um, and changed things and also uh, pushed some uh, people to come here as well in the latter 19th century. Also, um, and I can attest to this, <laughs> still very few roads. It's really difficult to build roads in such a mountainous um, country. Uh, and so with very few roads, uh, people weren't able to travel. And so that means that goods um, and also ideas, conversations aren't happening as much as other places where there's uh, good transportation, good roads. Later on in the 19th century, we're going to see railroads being built up in Norway um, and more roads being built. And so is going to improve then. Surprisingly, um, you had to go talk to people <laughs> if you wanted to communicate. Uh, there, were, uh, there were no cell phones, uh, obviously, um, and if you wanted to uh, chat with someone, you'd have to go over the mountain, you'd have to walk to see them, um, you had to send a letter, and of course that's slower, and so um, ideas uh, travel, um, traveled slower then. Here's what your family might have looked like if you lived in Norway in about the year 1820. And so, um, not to say that every family was comprised of uh, a mom and a dad and a son and a daughter, but um, this is sort of the average, four people uh, in, uh, in the family. Here's what your home may have looked like uh, in Norway in 1820. Um, you remember that uh, a lot of people were living in rural areas and um, 
not much of that rural area was actually flat, good tillable land, so your farm may look something um, like this. In Norway, uh, there were very strict inheritance laws um, where uh, upon the death or retirement of the father, um, the farm and the property would go to the oldest son, and if there wasn't an oldest son, um, then that would go to the oldest daughter. Um, land was rarely ever transferred out of families, and so it was really difficult to find land for sale or to get land. And in Norway, so much of your status, your social status, was dependent on owning land and um, who you were on, on the farm. So um, in addition to the son, the oldest son, or if it was the, um, the daughter, if there wasn't a son, um, the other siblings had to be sort of paid off. And so while they didn't get the land, they would get um, something uh, sort of uh, relatively like the same amount. Um, so they would get you know, furnishings and cows and, and those kinds of things. So in the 1820s, our farm uh, would be split in half, basically. So everybody's getting kind of an equal share. Well, if we fast forward uh, to the next generation, this is what families look like. This is the size of, of families. We have more kids. In fact, in this family, there are eight, um, eight kids instead of two. And so there are some factors that are um, creating this population explosion in Norway. And one of those is peace. Um, it, it, you may have uh, read or studied up a little bit about the Napoleonic Wars. And these were fought across uh, Europe from 1803 to 1815. And it was a huge um, scale war. And Norway, as a part of the Kingdom of Denmark, was engaged in, in that war. I think it's really interesting to learn that an estimated 2.5 to 3.5 million people in the military, and in addition, 3 million civilians died in, in this war, whether it's because of warfare, um, injuries, sickness, or um, the result of things that happen because of war, like famines where you know, food sources are, are wiped out. Well, after Napoleon was, was defeated, then um, I'm not saying things were, um, were always um, super peaceful, but uh, you didn't have this large scale war going on, so more people were surviving. Also, um, we have the introduction of a vaccination in Norway, and that's a vaccination uh, for smallpox. Um, this vaccine was introduced uh, in 1796 by Edward Jenner. And if those, if those of you may not know anything about smallpox, I'm always tempted to like show a picture of someone who's infected with this disease, but you know, not at lunchtime, okay? Um, so it's a very infectious disease. It causes a rash and then blisters, and then there are lots of other complications. So it has a mortality uh, rate of 30 to 35%. Uh, and in Europe, smallpox was the leading cause of death in the 1700s, and it killed almost half a million people every year. So the first vaccination uh, in Norway was given in 1801, and then vaccinations became mandatory in Norway in 1810. And so as you have more and more people being vaccinated, you have fewer and fewer people dying and succumbing to, to this disease. And this is a picture of a vaccination certificate uh, from, uh, from Norway. So when you got vaccinated, you had to have this certificate, this um, uh, something to document that you had indeed uh, had this vaccination. Well, another uh, reason for this population explosion seems kind of strange, but it is the potato. Uh, the potato arrived in Norway in 1750, but it actually took a lot of convincing by pastors uh, in the Lutheran church that the potato did not cause leprosy. Um, well, and I totally get this because the potato is a member of the nightshade family where there are a lot of poisonous plants. Um, same thing for the tomato and lots of other plants that today we, we eat. But, you know, if, um, if it was a member of a poisonous uh, plant family, I might be reluctant to, um, to eat that. So um, the pastors had sort of this um, uh, campaign to get people to eat it. And also there was a famine going on in Norway because of, a Briti of the British blockade during the, the Napoleonic Wars. So food was not getting into Norway from other places. And so people reluctantly decided to turn to the potato as it, and it turned out to be a really viable um, food source. The potato, as you may know, is a native crop of uh, South America Grows, uh, grown in the Andes Mountains, and so that terrain, that rocky soil where it originated, um, trans, uh, was perfect for uh, the rocky terrain and soil in, in Norway. And so more people were getting better nutrition, 
um, and living longer lives. So and then let's look at your inheritance uh, let's, uh, in the next generation. So the oldest son is still going to get the farm. Um, so his chunk may be seen as being a little bit bigger. But now he's got seven siblings that he has to sort of pay off. And unfortunately, there may not be enough uh, resources to pay off those um, uh, those siblings because we still have um, we have more people but we have the same amount of resources we have the same amount of land we have the same amount of property we have the same amount of furniture the same amount of cows but just uh, just more people so what are you gonna do <laughs> um, for some people it, it may have uh, been first a journey to the cities to try to find uh, work to try to find opportunities there but seeing as this population explosion was affecting all of Norway um, chances weren't exceptionally good that you were going to make it in uh, in the larger or um, our cities and, and larger area, uh, areas like uh, population areas so you might choose to come to America um, because you could get land um, you could you could buy land you could get it for free technically free if you took advantage of homestead acts um, so land, if that was something that you really desired, you could get that here and you could be a man, you could be a, a, a woman. Uh, so that was an opportunity that a number of Norwegians decided to take. Um, you could also start your own, your own business. Um, so uh, this gentleman here is, has started an employment and intelligence <laughs> office. And so he's offering uh, work or helping other people find uh, find jobs. Uh, and uh, so it is it is kind of funny. Um, yeah, I, I I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's not what we think. Girls furnish on application, but I do think that that's kind of uh, kind of funny. <laughs> um, you may want to, uh, to come to the United States for religious freedom. Um, uh, as well. Oh, sorry. First, we had to have political freedom. I'm sorry. Um, Norway was not an independent country until 1905, and it was first ruled by Denmark for 500 years uh, up until 1814, and that's the end of the Napoleonic War and, or wars. And um, Norway was then sort of ceded to to Sweden um, because Denmark had sided with France, and Napoleon lost the war. So um, they. Even though they uh, created a constitution for themselves, they still were um, technically under the King of Sweden until uh, they got their independence in 1905. And so if you were not keen on the political situation, you might choose to come to the United States. And as I mentioned, or in addition to political reasons, you might also come for religious reasons. In Norway, there was state, a state church, and so everybody had to be a member of the Lutheran church. And if you weren't, if you were a dissenter, then you would be punished um, for that. And it was quite complicated because as the state church, the, um, the Lutheran church in Norway also held all of the records. And so if you um, had, you know, were baptized, if you were married, all of those records that today, um, or a lot of those records today that you might find at the courthouse were actually at, at the church. And so um, it was kind of complicated. And maybe you um, want to escape wars, or perhaps you want to um, fight in one. Uh, during the American Civil War, the, um, the Union is offering uh, good bonuses, or enticing bonuses, I guess, for, uh, for many people, to, or for many men to fight uh, on that side. And so perhaps that might entice some young men to come to the United States. In addition, uh, there were also good uh, benefits for veterans, which might include free land. So, um, so that might be the enticement. Or maybe you're just ready for an adventure. Um, these, are, these are a couple of people who are in a, uh, a logging camp in, uh, in Alaska. And so um, they have chosen to go to uh, one of the frontiers of, a, of America in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and sort of make their, uh, make their way there. Well, who left uh, Norway? There were different groups at different times. And in the 1840s, it was older couples and families. This included families with grandparents. And then in the 1850s and 1860s, it was younger families uh, with younger children. The families were largely from the rural areas of Norway, and many had been engaged in either farming or trades that supported agriculture. 
In the, eight, in the 1870s, though, we see that there's a shift uh, from families to more individuals immigrating and more young people immigrating, especially from urban areas. So even though Norway was experiencing a very strong economy during this time, there was increased mechanization, more industrialization, and that meant that fewer people were needed for jobs um, because a machine could, could do your work. And unemployment then pushed these people to, um, to emigrate. This is a picture of uh, Gertrude Jan's daughter, Aga, and she came to Decorah, Iowa in 1904 with her mother. In 1900, both her father and her grandfather died and left them with few means of support. And as they were preparing to leave uh, Norway, Gertrude had her picture taken in her regional costume from, uh, from her daughter. I like this graph here because it sort of shows the ebbs and flows of Norwegian immigration. Uh, and you can see that it became more common in the 1840s. We see um, in the 1860s, there's sort of an uptick. Um, America fever, if you will, this, uh, has taken hold. Um, we can also relate these sort of ebbs and flows to what's going on in the world as well as in the United States. And so in 1846, our state uh, becomes uh, a member of the Union. Um, in 1849, the British government repeals the Navigation Acts, which allows boats to carry freight from Canada uh, back to Norway, which now makes this route more profitable. So you see um, immigrants coming uh, through Quebec, through Canada, and then into the United States. In the 1860s, in 1862 in particular, we have the Homestead Act, which was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln. Also, during this time period, um, we have Native Americans being pushed off of, their, off of their lands, and so those lands are opening up to, to white settlers. At the end of the, uh, of the Civil War, we have um, more steamships available, so uh, that's making travel more uh, available, more accessible to people. The Transcontinental Railroad is finished in 1869. There are lots of different things, but uh, those, those events correspond to a lot of, of sort of ebbs and flows, the uh, high points and low points of, of immigration by Norwegians to America. So what about the actual process of, of immigrating? Well, first you had to make preparations. And for Norwegians in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it might mean uh, getting some money. Um, and this could be gotten by selling your household goods at auction, uh, and sometimes even selling your property, perhaps selling your farm uh, to get some money. You needed some papers for travel, but that was mostly just papers to get out of Norway, not to get into the United States. Um, you didn't really need uh, documents here until um, the early 20th century to come here to the United States. Um, you might also want uh, need to have a document uh, that says you signed out of your parish, your vaccination forms, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. You will also need to get to the port. Um, uh, that might be kind of challenging in Norway. You might have to take different sort of modes of, of transportation to get there. Uh, many people didn't live in port cities in Norway, and so you could make your way there on foot, by wagon, or perhaps uh, by sled, like these people here. Next was your actual journey. And the first organized group of Norwegian immigrants uh, who were largely Quakers, dissenters, uh, to the Lutheran State Church traveled uh, here to the United States on the sloop called the Restoration. And I love the story about the Restoration because it sounds like, oh, this is a grand ship, but it's actually called the Restoration because uh, it was a broken down ship and they restored it. So, uh, <laughs> so it has this grand name, but only because it was repaired. Um, it left Stavanger in, uh, in July, uh, Stavanger, Norway in July, actually on July 4th, 1825, with 52 passengers, and it arrived on October 9th, 14 weeks later in New York with 53 passengers, so there was a berth uh, on board. And what I think is really amazing is that this, this sailing ship was only 52 uh, feet long and 16 feet wide, and to have 53 people on this ship um, is pretty amazing. Um, they also, um, that did cause some problems because they were too small and overloaded, and so this poor group had just a series of unfortunate events. Uh, but anyway, 
Um, what type of ship you might travel on really depended on what time you were sailing. So as I mentioned before, after the Civil War, you might be um, on a, a steamship, but before that time period, you were most likely to be traveling on a sailing ship. And that could take anywhere you know, between six to 14 weeks. And we heard the restoration took 14 weeks for them to get here. But on average, you would probably spend about eight weeks and of course, that uh, the passage time was dependent on the weather. I mean, if the wind is not blowing, you are not going, or you're going, if the wind's blowing the wrong way, you can't get yourself righted, but you're not going in the correct direction. Um, so people who were traveling on sailing ships had a, had a slightly different um, experience, many of them, if they weren't traveling first class. So they were expected to bring things with them to sustain themselves through the journey. And so that would also, that might include bedding, you know, your clothing, general things that you would need, but also food. And so imagine packing um, 10 weeks of food for, um, for yourself. Um, so in your minds, go into your, your kitchen cupboards, um, as you think about what you have in your kitchen, and choose things from your cupboards that would last for 10 weeks without uh, refrigeration, um, without having to be frozen, um, that would last for 10 weeks. So you can imagine that the people were, were not eating steak and you know, hamburgers and uh, fresh fruit and all of those things that, um, that we enjoy today. So think about uh, soda crackers. Um, there was one uh, ship company that had a, has this wonderful list of things that passengers should take with them if they have to bring food. And so the list has things like this. And this is just for one person. So you should bring 17, 17 pounds of bread. That's like soda crackers. So when you all go to the grocery store, go to the cracker aisle and figure out how many boxes of soda crackers you're going to need for this journey. <laughs> I think it's a lot. They recommended 24 pounds of dried meat um, and also um, things like coffee. But they only recommended three pounds, and I think you should definitely bring more than, than three pounds. But anyway, and like I said, keep in mind this is just for one, one person. So you know, if our family of 10 were traveling, we would have to multiply this times uh, times 10. And so uh, that's a lot of luggage for just, um, for just food. And the other thing that you might worry about on a sailing ship would be water. So um, you have a lot of salt water around you, but that's not any good for, for drinking. So the ships would provide uh, the water for you, but that's, that's only um, about three quarts per day per person. And so that's for cooking and for drinking and not for bathing and washing your clothes. Um, so some things you really, you know, you really have to give up to, um, to travel to, to the United States at that time period. Now, after the Civil War, more, uh, more immigrants are going to be able to travel on steamships because that technology is becoming more and more available. And so, of course, the journey is, uh, is cut. Instead of eight to 10 weeks, you can expect to spend about 10 days on board the ship. And food and bedding and other, I can't really call them amenities, but maybe essentials, uh, would be provided for you as a part of your ticket price. Well, there were many, many ports of arrival here in the United States, not just New York. And immigrants coming through New York earlier, uh, from about the years 1855 to 1890, they would have arrived at Castle Garden. But the increased number of immigrants coming to New York and having that be one of the main port, uh, points of entry for immigrants led to the construction of Ellis Island, which was in operation from 1892 to 1954. But other significant uh, ports were Philadelphia, New Orleans, and Quebec, Canada, from which immigrants then traveled through the Great Lakes. And so their ports of entry might be places like Chicago or Milwaukee. Well, many uh, immigrants uh, settled in, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in New York. They settled in North Central Texas, in Montana, in Seattle, Washington. But actually, by the turn of the 20th century, 80% of Norwegian Americans live somewhere in the Midwest. So states like Illinois, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. And here's a map of sort of the distribution of, of Scandinavians, uh, largely Norwegians. And you can see that uh, it's heavily populated uh, with Norwegians here in the upper Midwest. Norwegians were the third uh, largest group of foreign-born settlers in Iowa, and the first Norwegians came to Iowa's southernmost county. In 1839 or early 1840, we're not sure, individuals and families from Schuld and Stavanger municipalities, which are in Rogaland uh, County and Herdanger County uh, on the western uh, coast of Norway, 
uh, they came uh, from Norway and then they settled in what, was, what is uh, called Sugar Creek Township, and that's in Lee County, Iowa, and that's the blue dot uh, and down at the bottom, and that's near Keokuk. The early settlers, settlers included some of the former pa uh, passengers on the restoration. So the passengers on the restoration landed in New York, some of them settled there, others, um, as I said, things didn't, oh, it didn't work out great for them, and so then so many of them migrated to Illinois. Um, some things didn't work out great for them there, and so then they're, they're hopping over to Iowa to, um, to try their luck there. Um, the early, uh, like I said, the early settlers, some of them were from uh, passengers from the Restoration, but unfortunately, despite the fact that, that they were dissenters, there, there was some dissension among them, and they had some religious tensions and some land ownership issues there, and so they ended the, um, the settlement after about a decade, and they sent their, uh, those people then uh, um, were sent north, where they pushed themselves northward uh, for different farming opportunities. The three main settlement areas in, in Iowa for Norwegians were in the Northeast, so these are counties like uh, Alamakee, Clayton, Fayette, Winnesheet counties, and those are the red dots. Um, North Central, which include the counties of uh, Emmett, Mitchell, and Winnebago, as well as Worth counties, and those are the yellow dots. And then in the central uh, part of Iowa, in Hamilton, Hardin, Polk, and Story counties, and those are the green dots uh, on this map of the state. In the early 1850s, Norwegians from the west coast of Norway came directly to northeast, north central, and central Iowa. And immigration did slow during the American Civil War, but then quickly increased after 1866. Individuals and families often came with the intention of starting farms and businesses. They also established schools, churches, and settlements, and some of them even became permanent towns like Badger, Roland, Scarville, Sheldahl, and St. Ansgar. And from these early settlements, these uh, early settlements were often called the mother colonies, um, places, uh, particularly places like Decorah, Iowa. Um, immigrants then leapfrogged uh, farther north and farther west as opportunities presented themselves in places like Minnesota and the Dakotas in Canada. Right. So what did immigrants bring with them to Iowa and to the other places that, uh, that they settled? Well, um, many of them brought trunks um, because that's what they would pack their, uh, their possessions in. And these are just a few of the trunks from uh, Westerheim's collection. We had, you would bring, most likely you would bring what you, what you had. So if you had a beautiful decorated trunk, that's what you would bring. If you had something that was plainer, that is what you would bring. There are some instances where people did buy luggage, and in fact there were a couple of um, makers of trunks in Norway who were making trunks that were decorated, but they were specifically for, um, for immigrants. So um, your trunks would be kind of like your closets, because you didn't have a closet. So you just pick up your closet and pack that up and, and head to the United States. Of course, there are many things that would be found uh, in the immigrants' trunks. Uh, and first of all, you want to bring some things that were important for the journey. And what was packed was really up to the individual, but it might include things like food, um, cooking and serving wear, clothing, bedding, a Bible or a hymnal, and something to do when you're on, uh, on the journey. Well, trunks may carry things from the immigrants' new homes and uh, as well as some of their new lives in America. And these things might include housewares, cookware, tableware, candlesticks, uh, might be some tools. Uh, for example, here's a, um, a fishing net. So, you know, if you thought you were going to be uh, doing some fishing, bring your tools along with you. Immigrants also brought things uh, that were meaningful to them, as well as irreplaceable, and items that had been passed on from generation to generation, or maybe something that commemorated a very special event. This might include annual bowls, um, special clothing, or this thing at the bottom, which is a, which is a mango board, and in, uh, in Norway was used as a betrothal gift. So. Um, not, uh, not perhaps, perhaps useful um, because when immigrants were, were uh, coming here, they would have uh, been using irons. <laughs> but um, that useful maybe for remembering a very special occasion in your family's life. 
You also want to bring portable wealth. These are things that can easily be transported in the trunks or on your person. And these, these would be things that if you got into a pinch, you could sell to, um, to help support yourself. So you might bring things like jewelry, um, silverware, um, fine silver pieces, or something that was made of precious metals. Well, immigrants also brought with them their hand skills or, uh, or their trades. And, uh, and these included um, jobs, uh, skills that they had, uh, jobs that they had done uh, in Norway. And these were things that were often translatable to their new lives here in America, so very valuable. They might include things like um, uh, sewing, being a hat maker, uh, cooking, uh, making shoes, blacksmithing, construction, fishing, uh, all kinds of skills that can be quite useful here in America. Also, um, of course, immigrants uh, brought things with them in their hearts, their love for their home country, their faith, their desires, their traditions. One important thing that Norwegians brought with them here to the United States was their language. And we see uh, this is really strong in, uh, in Norwegian America, especially in the press, um, and their very prolific publishing houses some of which were able to sustain themselves well into the 20th century, despite political and social pressures to use English. So use of the Norwegian language was strong, especially in Midwestern communities, and Lutheran churches of Norwegian Americans, where services and materials were even printed in Norwegian. Well, the desire to keep the language tradition was very strong with one particular group of Norwegian immigrants. In the 1860s, a handful of Norwegian immigrants to Iowa who were followers of the Lutheran State Church in Norway or the Norwegian Synod tried to develop a system of parochial schools where they could teach all of the subjects, including religion and the Norwegian language as a way of maintaining their Norwegian identity. The idea, however, was not popular uh, with the lay people of the Norwegian Synod's church congregations because they preferred their children to go to the, what was called the common schools or the public schools uh, so that they could learn American ways and also learn, uh, learn English. The common school controversy, as it's called, um, was really about that effect of uh, public school on the cultural assimilation of immigrant children. And this uh, sort of battle, if you will, um, I'll say it's really small scale because it didn't affect everyone, but, um, uh, but in particular, it affected a lot of uh, Norwegians in Northeast Iowa. Um, this debate actually went on uh, in, throughout the mid-1800s. And as a result, though, of this, um, a part-time religious education was established where the Norwegian language could be taught in these parochial schools as well as the religion, uh, religious lessons. And um, that would be done like you know, during two weeks every so often and allow the students then to continue to go to the public schools as well. I think it's really interesting that even despite this um, sort of compromise, that only three, only three parochial schools were built, one in Minnesota, one and two in the Decorah, Iowa area, which isn't highly um, unusual since Decorah was the seat or the home of the Norwegian Synod. This is a, a log school house that was built in the 1800s and it served as a parochial school in rural Decorah for about four um, decades. And you can come to Vesterheim and uh, sit in these seats if you'd like to. The uh, Norwegians also brought with them a desire for um, higher education, and this is evidenced by the large number of academies and colleges that were founded by Norwegian Americans. And we can look uh, at the Norwegian American Lutheran colleges that still exist today and have their histories connected to Iowa. Places like Augustana College, even though it's not, uh, not here in Iowa, we have Waldorf University, and also Luther College. And here's a picture of Luther College's first uh, main building uh, Luther is now on three, main number three, <laughs> and it doesn't look anything like, uh, like this. Hmm. Well, now I wanted to share a few um, mostly Iowa immigrant uh, stories with you. This is a picture of Johannes uh, Tokheim, who was born near Oda in Hardanger, Norway. And in 1880, Johannes and his two brothers joined an older brother who had settled near Thor in Humboldt County, Iowa. Johannes now known as John, uh, paid for his passage by working for 10 months for a local farmer. 
He apprenticed as a tinsmith. He attended business college in Des Moines. He worked for a year in Chicago as a tinner. He married, and then he returned to Thor in 1896. He opened up a tin shop, gradually adding hardware, well pumps, and he sold kerosene and gasoline for lamps and stoves. But handling these materials was messy, and it was very dangerous. So he devised a safer system. A storage tank was buried outdoors, and inside a pump with a glass domed meter, uh, he could measure and dispense the liquids. He applied for a patent. And although gasoline uh, stoves were on their way out, automobiles were on their way in. And the Tokai Manufacturing Company opened in Cedar Rapids and quickly provided the technology for a new gas pump. So it's not a very glamorous photo, but, but here on the bottom is um, one of the very early uh, sort of pumps there. And uh, it's, uh, we, we dug that out of the dregs of Vesterheim's collection. So um, it's nice, to, it's nice to, uh, to be able to see it again. But uh, so Tokheim was, uh, was extremely um, successful. I really like this, um, this story here. These are millstones that were brought by Knud Nordsman, and he was um, from the Kongsleyen farm in Vong, uh, Valders, Norway, which is a very interior uh, valley of Norway. And he probably brought these about uh, the year 1850. He brought the stones because he had heard that there were no stones in America, and he was really worried about how he was going to grind his grain. So um, just imagine hauling these things in your trunk uh, to America because there are no stones. Well, he came and he found out that there, there were indeed stones, and very soon many mills all through, um, throughout Iowa. Later on, uh, members of his family brought over the original mill house um, from that farm, and you, you can see that as well as the stones at Vesterheim today. This is a beautiful um, brooch, a solia. It's a Veslin solia, and it comes from the Sine family. Um, the Sine family, uh, there were parents and about and had and their six children. They were leaving the Hardanger area in 1893 when one of the relatives, probably the mother's sister, ran out and pinned this brooch on the oldest daughter in the family. So a very um, very beautiful piece and a wonderful reminder of family. This is a, um, a tablecloth along uh, with the maker. Her name is Anna uh, Schutten, and she uh, immigrated from Seoul in Norway to America in 1907, and she immigrated alone at the age of 17. Her mother packed cloth, pattern, scissors, needle, and thread, and got Anna started on the tablecloth so that she could work on it during what, uh, the, the very lonely times, because as Anna said, my mother knew that I would be uh, what I would be facing, leaving my family behind. Anna learned the hard iron embroidery technique from her mother, and she did some samples at school. She borrowed $78 for the voyage from an aunt who was already in America, and she worked for that aunt for $2 uh, dollars a week for three years until she got married and then moved to Kenyon, Minnesota. She added the crocheted border in the, in the 1950s so that the cloth would better fit a new dining room table. Helena Bryn Johnson sewed this pouch at a young age. Among the fabrics are pieces of her first printed uh, cotton dress. She had grown up wearing dresses made of homespun and home, uh, home woven fabrics, so it was a very special thing for her to get this printed fabric. In 1853, she immigrated to Clorinda, Iowa, in the southwest, along with Andrew Peterson, whom she married the next year. The bag originally held love letters passed between she and her husband during their courtship in, uh, in Norway. This is a trunk that was given to Ingeborg Vosley at her confirmation by her father. Uh, she married and two years later in 1868, she and her husband sailed from Bergen, Norway with this chest filled with food. They were on the water for about seven weeks. They traveled up the St. Lawrence to Quebec and from Quebec, they came to Decorah in a boxcar on a cattle train on iron-faced wooden rails. She later moved to Winnebago County and finally settled in Northwood in Worth County. Oh, this, this poor guy here. <laughs> um, 
Nikolai Farstveit um, worked at an orphanage in Norway, and he had heard that his brother had done well in South Dakota, so he decided to emigrate there in 1923. His mother hand wove and sewed a pair of long underwear to keep him warm. He probably couldn't bear to tell her he was allergic to wool, so these pieces remained pristine, unused. <laughs> They're really, they're in amazing shape because they were, they were indeed never, uh, never used. And this is, uh, we also have another example from another family too, where the, uh, the mother, the grandmother had made these beautiful uh, set of mittens for the whole family, but most of the family was allergic to wool, so they could, they could never use the, um, the mittens. But we're a great reminder of a family back in Norway. The first Norwegian fam uh, family that came to Humboldt County from Hardanger, Norway in 1870 was that of Ola Tom. Uh, he, brought, he bought some of the cheap uninhabited, uh, uninhabited prairie land around that area. And a few years later, the railroad arrived and they built a station on his property. A small town then sprung up almost immediately, but it didn't have a name. So residents felt that the town ought to have a powerful Norwegian name since he had been one of the first settlers and there were other Norwegians there and they didn't know any uh, Norwegian more powerful than Thor. So that is what the um, town became called. And it also then became a center for more and more immigrants <coughs> coming from the Hardanger area, like Ronhild Olsen, who brought this woven coverlet or blanket with her first to Chicago and then to Thor, Iowa. These are cowbells. Um, they were brought in 1867 to Northeast Iowa by immigrants uh, from Sortrondelag, Norway. And both bells uh, were wedding gifts. One belonged to the Reitens and one to the Shuros uh, family. Well, today we heard some beautiful music and I think we can all attest that music is a really important tradition for many of us. Um, it continues to be you know, passed down, it continues to be shared, and of course immigrants were bringing their musical traditions uh, from the old world to the new. Um, the Halversons family, though, didn't actually bring a fiddle with them from Norway to Decorah, but music was so um, important to them that their son Sigurd uh, uh, went and finally managed to acquire one from brothers in Wisconsin who made these traditional instruments. Well, and what, uh, what may be the most tangible link, uh, link to heritage sometimes, are, uh, is recipes and food ways. Uh, some of these traditions, I think, seem to be more universally acceptable, and I will even venture edible. Um, these are things like lefse and flatbread. Um, and lefse, of course, is a traditional um, flatbread. There are lots of different recipes, but uh, in our area of, uh, of the world, many people make it with uh, potatoes, riced potatoes, and flour, butter, and milk or cream. It's rolled out very, very thin, uh, and you use a grooved uh, rolling pin, like the one uh, shown here. Uh, also, you can make uh, making flatbread that continued uh, and continues today to be a, a, a tradition. Uh, unlike lefse, though, it's just made with flour, salt, and water, but it is also rolled out very thin, but grilled until it's crispy, so not as uh, flexible and, and pliable and soft as the um, as the lefse. So here's the um, the lefse rolling pin was used by Eric and Helena Eggy, who immigrated to Winnishie County in 1852, and the flatbread uh, roller was brought from Norway by Gertrude Lund to Worth County, Iowa. Well, other food ways or recipes may be accepted by some and merely tolerated by others. Um, Lunafisk, literally live fish, is dried stockfish that has been reconstituted in water and lye. I think it's interesting that today more lutefisk is consumed in the United States than any of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, <laughs> and for some Norwegians um, uh, and, and Norwegian Americans, tickets to lutefisk suppers are really coveted items. In fact, Big Canoe and Highland Lutheran churches in rural Decorah are already advertising uh, their supper in November mm. and reminding folks that there are carryouts for anyone who wants to enjoy lutefisk at home. Um, so um, I, I have had lutefisk. I'm not a big fan, but I have tried it. <laughs> I probably won't be going to the Highland Lutheran church for dinner. <laughs> But they do often serve something else like meatballs, so I, yeah. could, uh, I could probably head there. This is a, um, 
this box here is, is something from the museum's collection. Uh, it's really interesting to have this beautiful yeah. box. Well, I'm just going to finish up today with, with one food tradition that has become even best. What? I want to know about that. Oh, okay. Well, you're going to know, you're going to learn about that right now. <laughs> so I'm going to finish with this one food tradition, which is immensely popular here in America, but also in the Scandinavian countries, and that is craft brewing of beer. Uh, craft brewing of beer is defined as small, independent, and traditional, and that's exactly what this copper kettle represents. This copper kettle was not brought from Norway by the people who used it, but they wanted to be able to brew beer uh, soon after they arrived in Winnesheet County. So they went and found one and purchased it and started making uh, the beer very soon after they arrived in 1856. This particular kettle was considered the best beer making uh, pot in all of the neighborhood. And so people would, uh, would borrow it around the neighborhood to, to brew their beer. Uh, beer was made in the spring and the fall, and according to a recipe, uh, was using uh, sprouted and dried barley and wild hops. And so I actually, uh, the, the family who donated this also um, included the recipe or the process for, um, for making the beer, um, which I think is, is great. So I'm just gonna share that with you as I finish up here today. So here was their process. The barley was soaked in sacks in Canoe Creek, which you can visit today at, uh, in Winnishie County, until it was sprouted. Then it was spread out in the house attic to dry. It was later further dried in a drying house on a neighborhood farm. Uh, it took six bushels of barley to make 50 gallons of beer. And they dried the bar, the dry barley then was ground in a horse-powered iron mill. They put hazel brush in the bottom of the barrel and uh, the, the barrel had a bottom spigot. They put the ground barley and wild hops on the brush and then added boiled water that had cooled. They drained off the malt uh, solution and cooked it. And once cooled, uh, yeast was added. Beer aged in, in the barrel until it tasted proper, and that was usually about two or more weeks. And then if you didn't uh, like the light beer, some farmers liked to add more alcohol, so then they, uh, they made it into 20% beer. <laughs> well, whatever your ancestors brought, and whatever you have brought with you, and whatever immigrants are, are bringing today with them, identity, often our cultural identity, um, our heritage, it's reflected in our baggage. So whether that's our physical, things that we have, psychological, what's in our minds, or spiritual, what's in our hearts. And I think we very often are what we pack. So thanks uh, everybody today. I also want to give a, a shout out to Humanities Iowa for um, bringing me here um, to visit you. It's great to be back. And also for um, allowing us to share the exhibit with you. Questions if anybody has them, but I'm not pressuring you to have any. <laughs> it was there. And can people come and examine the items of course, you brought? Of course. Thank you, Toba. Yes, I have um, a replica of a trunk. Um, it's uh, it's not one from the 1800s, but uh, but it is uh, constructed and uh, painted like some of the trunks in the museum's collection. I also have a few um, pieces, uh, items representing what people would have packed in their trunks. And the beautiful thing about this is that it's, you can touch it. So come on up, you can touch these things, uh, you can examine them, and uh, I welcome you to do that this afternoon. Hey,